The new Avalon Institute of Science has earned its reputation for developing and innovating upon technologies for a wide variety of applications. For many years, researchers and engineers were able to bring back lost tech into practical and functional applications, along with making new discoveries. With Battlesuit research following the clan invasion, the NAIS got to work quickly with the backing of the Federated Sun's military command, which wanted their own versions of the terrifying elemental battle armor. Companies like Hom Hines Design Bureau were also tapped in an all-hands-on-deck scenario. In conjunction with General Motors, Hom Hines got to work. Unfortunately for those seeking a quick design process, it wouldn't be until 3062 when Hom Hines would submit a proposal for an assault-class battle armor to the Federated Sun's Armed Forces Command. Similar to the design goal of the Marauder battle armor, it seemed that the h h tried to cram as much weaponry and ammo onto this design as possible at the cost of mobility. The 2000 kg battle armor, named the Grenadier, may not have been originally seen as a fire support unit, but by the time it was put into production, the value was obvious. The two early prototypes created by h h outperformed in demonstrations, yet the Federated Commonwealth decision makers decided not to put in an offer on the design. It wasn't until the Fedcom Civil War, when everything was falling apart and both sides were desperate for a battlefield advantage, did the Grenadier design get a second chance to shine. Due to bureaucratic shenanigans, the production on New Avalon was delayed and then delayed again, resulting in most of the Grenadiers produced held back from deployment. The production on Talcott did produce units, but at levels far too low to make a difference during the Fedcom Civil War. The timing of inconsequential events like the Word of Blake going to war against everyone and raining down nuclear hellfire negatively impacted the modest production and sales of the Grenadier. It just didn't have the opportunity to build a user base that could demonstrate the suit's effectiveness. In order to boost the word of mouth, GM executives with connections with to the Hom Hines group organized demonstration units of retired soldiers who could travel to hotspots around the Federated Sun's territory in order to convince battlefield commanders that the Grenadier was useful. Operation Parade, as it was called, was moderately successful as these Grenadier-equipped battalion and companies participated in active combat. Fed Sun's commanders began to see their use as fire support in ambushes and even rapid assaults to take out high-value targets. So what was being sold to these commanders? As previously noted, the Grenadier is an assault battle armor, weighing in at 2,000 kilograms. It includes 540 kilograms of standard stealth armor, which is a 9 plus 1 for those of you playing the game at home. The right arm has a basic manipulator, and the left has none, so there's no swarming, leg attacks, or tearing the armor plates off of battle mechs with this battle armor. The run speed is 21.6 kilometers per hour, which is a pretty decent clip for battle armor, that's a 2 in the home game. However, there are no jump jets to be found. Sad, I know. There are two primary loadouts for the Grenadier you're likely to run into on the battlefield. The standard is armed with an SRM-4 located in the shoulders, and unlike most other battle armor, it comes with plenty of ammo. Not one shot, not two, not even three, but seven reloads on a single soldier. That is quite a few missiles. On the left arm is a modular weapons mount that can carry the following weapons. A small laser, a flamer, a magshot Gauss rifle, a light recoilless rifle, or a light target acquisition system. How's that for a variety? Pick your poison, battlefield commanders. Finally embedded in the right arm is an AP weapon mount, which adds even more opportunities to custom fit the suit to your liking. As far as generalized, heavy-hitting platforms, this Grenadier is a leader. In addition to the standard build, there's also a more specialized hunter-killer version of the Grenadier. Instead of an SRM-4 in the body, the HK has an SRM-5 with four shots. If you're curious why, this is going to be a design that you'll run when you really want your first shot or two to matter. That extra SRM is part of achieving that goal. In the left arm, the modular weapons mount can carry a mag shot Gauss rifle or a compact NARC with three shots. For those who might need the reminder, a NARC is a beacon that can be attached to a target which then sends out a homing signal for long range missiles or artillery missiles. In the right arm, the HK version of the Grenadier carries a fire drake support needler which is akin to a shotgun that fires extremely sharp flaming needles at the target. If you need an example of how much damage this can do, imagine a teenage mech frog telling his first high school girlfriend that he loved her after a romantic date, and then immediately she breaks up with him. So yeah, it's pretty devastating. Moving on from the personal trauma, how did the Grenadier actually do in combat? 
Reports from the fighting in New Avalon City showed that a company of grenadiers was used to effectively ambush and destroy a level 2 medium blakist battle mechs using conventional SRM and Inferno munitions. Oh, oh grenadier, you had me at Inferno. I'm almost ready to forgive your lack of jump jets. The blakists were unable to detect the battle armor before the ambush could be carried out, and the mechs became walking effigies to the gods of liquid fire. The battle mech armor plates that weren't on fire and driving up the heat inside were blasted away with volley after volley of short-range missile fire. After just a minute of firing, the entire level 2 was rendered into scrap. The strategic use of grenadiers forced the Blakist units on the planet to add battle armor units to support their battle mechs to try and mitigate the seemingly omnipresent threat of ambush. As far as variants go, we're looking at adding even more options with 3145 upgrade rush. There's a heavy flamer option that pulls in all the standard weapons in order to add a couple of heavy flamers. The firebugs among you will love that one. One upgrade to the Hunter Killer includes a Phydrake Needler, heavy recoilless rifle, and a Battle Armor C3I system. Another is equipped with a Magshot Goss Rifle, Phydrake Needler, and a small variable speed pulse laser. So what does this all mean for the Grenadier? Well, it's a powerful assault battle armor which can consistently put fire downfield. The standard stealth armor does make setting up ambushes easier as well as adding longevity to the unit in general combat situations. The drawback of not having jump jets is partially made up for with the weapons and the ground speed of a 2 instead of a 1, but considerations will have to be made if you want to move that grenadier across the battlefield in a timely manner. Overall, it's a great battle armor option with plenty of flexible loadouts. Now I should note there is a Grenadier 2 out there in use by the Federated Suns. Produced first in the 3137, it uses advanced intersphere technology and clan technology together to cut weight and improve the weaponry. There are four configurations, which I will list below in case you are curious and really want to field test the latest and greatest. Config A has a left arm mounted small laser and a clan SRM-4 with eight shots in the body. Configuration B has a Battle Armor C3I system in the left arm and a Clan LRM4 with 8 shots on the body. Configuration C has a Flamer on the left arm and a Medium Laser in the torso. And finally, Configuration D has a Fire Drake Support Needler in the left arm and a Battle Armor Artillery system mounted into the body with 8 shots. This artillery turns the Battle Armor into a pure fire support system that can lay down direct, indirect, and area effect fire in support of other troops. The artillery rounds can travel up to two tabletop maps away. Config D is an odd duck fielded exclusively by Republic of the Sphere forces. Time will tell if it will end up elsewhere now that the Republic has been gobbled up. Examples of that Grenadier 2D would be valuable commodities elsewhere. Hamilton City, Brunswick, New Avalon, Federated Sons, April 12th, 3074. The sight of the large, partially melted machinery of the Star Slab factory reminded Yuri of cheap practical effects from low budget holovids. They didn't look real, though almost nothing about the industrial district of Hamilton City looked real any longer. The streets were littered with remnants of war. Vehicles burned beyond recognition sat in among the remains of the dead, both Blakist and AFFS. In the distance, the sounds of battle were ongoing, though the media spread rumors of the conflict being at its end. Yuri slowly crept up the stairs of what used to be a light industrial building. Wrapped in the dirty rags that had once been a set of coveralls from his job on the line at the Star Slab factory, Yuri had long forgotten what life had been like before the word of Blake arrived. His job was gone, his family was gone. All that was left to Yuri now was surviving long enough to find the next meal and a place to sleep. If he was lucky, that place wouldn't be bombed into rubble by the Blakists or by the AFFS trying to remove them from the mortal realm. Reaching the third floor offices, Yuri began to search for food in the cabinets and abandoned desk drawers of the offices. The grocery stores and restaurants were looted years ago. The third floor of this office space was big and open, with piles of what used to be cubicles blasted into mounds of impenetrable wreckage. However, those reliable steel desks tended to hold up. Inside the drawers, there could be something worth eating. The outer wall of the office was blown open, exposing it to the open air along with the sounds of a running battle in the distance. 
the unmistakable blue flashes of light of particle projection cannon fire could be seen as two battle mechs traded shots among the broken machines of the Star Slab factory. Crawling over a few of the fallen partitions, Yuri opened the drawer of a partially burned desk as quietly as possible. Still, the warped metal ground against metal with a high-pitched sound that made Yuri nervous. He had seen the blakest monstrosities of metal combined with man many times, and he didn't intend to survive this long just to end up flayed by their primitive bladed weaponry. The drawer was empty, and Yuri sighed before moving on to the next desk. Eventually, he reached the partially darkened side of the room close to the blasted open wall, chewing on a year's old piece of meat jerky which tasted a bit like boot leather. Focused on checking out the manager's desk in the corner, he tripped and sprawled out into the debris-covered carpet with a heavy groan. Looking back to see what he tripped on, a monstrosity of a machine slowly leaned forward. Its outer coating seemed to shimmer and change to compensate for its movement. The arm that wasn't a terrifying weapon raised, and a single metallic finger was lifted to the machine's helmet in a universal sign for shut up right now. Yuri was terrified, scrambling away from the gigantic machine up against the intact wall. His heart began to beat a thousand times a minute as he waited for this battle armor to lunge forward toward him and to end his tragic life. He forced his eyes closed and waited for the death blow. It didn't come. For second after interminable second, he waited. Eventually, he opened his eyes again to see the figure in the battle armor hadn't moved. In fact, his hand was still up in the silencing gesture. The only thing that had changed was the slight rumble of heavy steps approaching. The unmistakable feeling of a battle mech's footfalls was ingrained in the people of New Avalon. Now Yuri adopted the frozen position after turning his head and looking outside to try and see if the battle mech was approaching. He swore to his deity that he would do good deeds if he was spared a terrible death, and then he swore to several other deities as well just in case. The sound of a mech's steps on the ferrocrete streets grew louder and Yuri cowered, unable to peel his eyes away as the mech came into view. Its menacing stare seemed to turn toward him for a moment before taking the next step. The moment it passed the blasted opening of the building wall, Yuri felt an air rush by his face. The battle armor that had stood motionless just a few moments before had run by him to the edge. Lifting his hands up to cup his ears, Yuri shook in terror as he watched the shoulders of the stealthy battlesuit open up and spew a quartet of shrieking missiles in the direction of the battle mech. As quickly as it did so, the battle armor leapt back from the opening, heading toward the back of the building. Flashes of light bathed the street outside, and after a few moments, a cacophony of autocannon fire rang out, though none of it in Yuri's direction. He lowered his hands from his still ringing ears and felt compelled to crawl over to the edge to see the result even as additional explosions filled the night air with fire. The mech still stepped, but the footfalls were erratic, which made Yuri all the more curious. Finally reaching the edge of the blasted wall, he pulled himself along the ground and peeked out. The battle mech showed the colors of the 44th Shadow Division, and it was bathed in fire like a proverbial wicker man. Missiles seemed to be impacting it constantly, either blasting away chunks of armor or spreading more burning liquid fire onto it. On and in the buildings, the sources of the missiles were hard to spot. Yuri thought he could see one just after firing, but then when the Blakest mech fired its medium laser at the spot, it hit nothing but the internal wall. A short-range missile strike from an alleyway impacted the mech's knee, and the charred actuator buckled. The whole battle mech lurched forward to take another step, but instead began to fall forward. In the last moments, the mech warrior must have panicked and hit his or her jump jets as they triggered and ended up accelerating the mech into the ground. That's when Yuri saw them. The battle-armored soldiers seemed to materialize out of the night itself and descended upon the fallen mech. In every vulnerable rent in the armor and exposed actuator, they poured laser and rifle fire. The Shadow Division mech struggled to stand, but it quickly fell again. This time it remained motionless. Yuri couldn't believe that he witnessed such a feat. The Blakest battle mechs had seemed invulnerable, but this one had no chance at all. As quickly as they appeared, the battle-armored soldiers melted away again. The Blakest mech still burned, but it did not seem that there was any attempt for the mech warrior to escape. Melted armor plate pooled on the street below the ruined monster of war. Yuri sighed after a breath of relief, though the ringing in his ears made his head ache. He pushed back from the edge, turning, laying on his back, looking up at the ruined office ceiling. He was alive. 
and God or the gods that apparently answered his prayers. That's it for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this little journey with the Grenadier. If you're a Grenadier fan, I'd love to hear how it plays on the tabletop game. How do you feel about the mini bits of fiction in these little battle armor videos? Do you think they're worthwhile, or should I just stick to the canon lore stuff? Please let me know in the comments, and we'll adapt if we need to. Big thanks for watching and sticking around this long. Remember, hitting all the buttons helps with the algorithm, and if you're able, joining the channel with a membership goes a long way to helping me keep this going. Membership provides access to the Discord, where the nonsense flows continually. Until next time, take care and go make the world a slightly better place today and tomorrow.